the speak episode 39 i i got nothing you you kick ass when you speak present or pitch if not these expert discussions and insider tips can help you right now today welcome to the what the speak podcast i'm your host brian kelly um what 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 Struggling with feeling comfortable in front of an audience when you present? Or maybe you're confident, but you have difficulty stumbling over filler words like um, ah, and ah. Well, you can start kicking ass today by signing up for our weekly VIP updates. As a bonus, you'll also receive 11 free tips that will uncover six psychological secrets to public speaking, plus five tips on how to stop using filler words. Go to whatthespeak.com slash VIP. Patricia Fripp, are you ready to answer the question, what the speak? Speak you, Brian. (laughs) I love it. Yes. Well, Patricia, you are a keynote speaker. But besides being a keynote speaker, you're a sought-after trainer and coach that works with organizations and individuals that want to gain powerful, persuasive presentation skills. But briefly, tell us about you. We want to hear exactly what your your story is and what you do for your clients. So just take us through that really quick. Well, I started as a men's hairstylist speaking nationwide. I spoke at Rotary Clubs to promote my business. I went to my first National Speakers Association convention, probably before you were alive, 1977. And two things happened. One, I realized this is what I could do next. I could be a speaker. I was smart enough to realize it would be a long-term goal. And at that point, I was two years into a 10-year lease on my own business. And I loved my my hairstyling business. I had all the movers and shakers from the financial district as my clients. So I, I didn't want to finish that business yet. Any speaker who wants to make a living as a speaker has to realize it's a long-term goal. Yeah. And then also at that same National Speakers Association convention, I got discovered by a big-time promoter who booked me to speak to 2,000 people on the same program with Dr. Robert Schuler, the minister from Garden Grove. So that was, that was a good start. I went full-time in 1984 when I became president of the National Speakers Association. And I built my business mostly as a keynote speaker. And this was a time there weren't that many women and people were so thrilled to see good speakers Mm -hmm. that they were less fussy than they am today. You were not expected to customize the way we are now. However, and this is advice that will be helpful for anyone, whatever business, at any point in their development. I was smart enough And it happened a few times before it really sunk in. When you listen to your clients, they will tell you how they want to spend money with you. And my clients were saying, oh, Patricia, while you're here, can you work with some of our executives? They're not really good speakers. And I heard more and more of that. And then a real turning point was at a, I was speaking for a large national company the sales meeting, and after the speech, the national sales manager said, Patricia, I liked your speech. However, I loved how you delivered it. Can you teach our salespeople to speak that way? Because yeah. it takes us a year to be in a position to deliver an hour presentation to our, a, a team of our target audience. It's worth $9 million a year, and we're losing sales, and it has nothing to do with our offering or our price. Our presentation... Our presentation skills are not as good as those of our competitors. Can you help us? And little did I know that what she said and the seminar I developed for them proved to me how I could always be demand, no matter what the economy, and even when I don't look quite as good on iMag anymore. So, Patricia, this is really interesting. I'd love to kind of break this down and talk about what are the topics or topics that you usually speak about when you get up in front of an audience. And 
it sounds like there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different types of speaking opportunities that you have. But can you distill it down to what are the core things, the core message that you share when you get up in front of an audience? I, the core message I share in totally different formats is how to be more powerfully persuasive and professional in your presentations. Now, it could be in sales presentations, could be leadership presentations, it could be how do you speak to your prospects in a seminar on how to promote your business. However, if there is not some aspect of storytelling, selling yourself and your ideas or presentation, I no longer accept them because there are plenty of good speakers. Yeah. There are very few speakers who are as good as I am at presentation skills. So what speakers find, the longer they've been doing this as a living, is it gets to the point where, although you could talk about lots of different subjects that you did in the past, hone in and be superb at what you do best. Well... For those um, in the audience that have, have not had the opportunity to hear you speak, I've, I've heard you speak, and I have to agree with that statement that Patricia Fripp is one of the best. She has a great wealth of experience and knowledge and is absolutely riveting. So pay attention closely to what we're going to discuss here. <laughs> You're very generous. <laughs> so Patricia, I would love to explore a little bit more your origin story. You touched upon it briefly when we first started this discussion, but let's talk about, you went from being, you know, a business owner, yes. having your own, your own, was it like a hair salon? It was a, a, a high-end hair salon focusing mostly on men's hairstyling. I only did men's hairstyling yeah. at a time when it was a brand new industry. And therefore, being one of the first women in a new industry, I got a lot of publicity. And so I, I knew how to maximize that. I was lucky, Brian, because I had a dad who was a very successful entrepreneur. And it is very important for all our listeners to understand, however they want to improve their presentation skills. I have been good at three, probably three major areas. I was great at cutting hair. I was good at promoting a small or medium-sized business. And I developed into a good speaker slash coach. And if we add on to that, I would include, let's add coaching. So that'd be four areas. However, I didn't start any with great talent. I started with an interest in, a commitment to, and a personality that was well-suited. For example, I had a great personality for any job where I interacted with people. And so as a hairstylist, that was great for me, especially in the salons that I worked in, where I had very smart, brilliant people. Especially at age 23, I only started dealing with men's hairstyling, movers and shakers in the financial district. And I would ask them questions. What made you the best salesperson in your company? What did you do to take your little company to develop it so a big company would want to pay you millions of dollars? So I used my job as a hairstylist as an education. So I maximized the opportunities as a speaker. There are many great speakers who have fabulous businesses who are introverts. It is easier in this business if you are an extrovert. It seems, I'm not saying there aren't good sales professionals or good leaders who are introverts. However, it's more natural if you are a bit more inclined to be an extrovert. So one, I started with an interest, a commitment, and a personality. Then I learned from people, whether they were mentors or bosses, who helped me develop myself. I learned from people who were good. And and I'd say for anybody, you don't have to have great talent. It helps if you do 
However, don't worry. You can learn to be a good speaker. Well, however, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to take some discipline. Yeah, I want to. I want to jump in here really quick and and talk about this whole idea. Like, how did you recognize in those early days when you were, you know, before you started speaking that mm-hmm. those skills, those the skill of persuasion, the mm-hmm. skill of communication and engaging, you know, whether it's your prospect or your audience, um, you know, what have you, how did you recognize that that was something that, that you needed to do in order to grow your business? And I know we've got a lot of um, entrepreneurs in the audience, as well as sales and marketing professionals, that I think this might, might be very relevant for. Probably just listening to people who were encouraging me. I went to Toastmasters and Dale Carnegie. I loved the Dale Carnegie public speaking class, won the stars and the pencils. And then I I learned, I took the, the sales, the Dale Carnegie sales course. Yeah. And that's when I started realizing, and of course, a lot of my hairstyling clients were sales professionals. And they would then come and tell me about some of the seminars they were attending and what they were learning. And with my pals, it, my buddies I met in the Dale Carnegie class, we had a group we called ourselves the Future Millionaires Breakfast Club. And we took every seminar that was available. We used to have a joke with the most educated, highly motivated people who don't have much time to work because we're going to seminars all the time. And, And so it was just involving myself, learning from others. And I probably didn't realize at the beginning I evolved. Uh, But, however, I was having so much fun taking the seminars and learning and learning from my clients. And I was young. I was ambitious. I just got so much thrill out of having interesting conversations with fascinating people that I was developing my education and my confidence and my knowledge probably without having any idea what the end result or the end goal would be. Got it. That's good. Okay, well, I would love to also explore with you, what are some of the things that you struggled with in those early early days? Because I know you, you've had a, a long career where you've been able to commit yourself to improving and mastering mm-hmm. a lot of these communication skills that you teach others. But what are some of the things that you struggled with when you began? And, and honestly, Patricia, if there's anything that today you still feel like you're working on, um, as as a professional, would love to hear that from you. It would have to be summed up into one area. Because I am a woman who doesn't have too many problems. The one area that when I started developing my, my own hairstyling business, starting to speak, and now, even as an established person, it's time management. Yeah. There is so much to do. There is so much we can do. It's making good choices. Uh, I have a friend who who says to to, to his clients, you know, you have no problems that an extra million dollars wouldn't solve. I would say I have absolutely no problems that another seven days a week wouldn't solve. I don't need more money. I need more time to get organized to catch up i live my life as i am sure every single person in business i live my life slightly overwhelmed and i'm more disciplined that i have no husband no children no plants no pets no debt i don't have the problems most people have and i don't have anyone that lives with me to say get out your damn office (laughs) Yeah, that could be problematic. Well, good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, I would love to transition our discussion now to talking about your your unique expert perspective. Yes. And one question that I had specific for you based on, on your unique experiences in life is mm-hmm. I know that you have a brother who yes. is in a very well-known rock band. Yes. I would love to see, is there anything that you've learned from your brother as a performer that has informed, inspired, or educated you on stage mechanics when you're presenting? 
Now, I have learned a lot from my brother. His name, Robert Fripp, he has a group, King Crimson. He's worked uh, with David Bowie and David Sylvie and a lot of great, great uh, musicians. Oh. However, more important than him as just Robert as a musician, Robert is the, a modest man who is considered by many a genius. And when I ask him about it, he says, sister, I know it's not true, so I begin to doubt the judgment about other things as well. He's a modest man, but he is very intelligent. He's actually as good a speaker as he is a guitarist. Mm. And we deliver seminars together. Yeah. Now, watching my brother on stage is not so much something I would learn from as far as stage mechanics. My brother sits in the dark and lets other people be center stage. Now, as a speech coach, I have to do that. Help other people be better on stage. Right. As a speaker, I am on stage. Now, my brother does not really have a personality to do what he's done all his life, which amazes me. I do. That's it. And when we do speeches together, my role is to protect him and be this <laughs> personality. But what I have learned from my brother, and this comes from I was cutting his hair, and this was after I'd retired because I haven't forgotten what it takes. I was cutting his hair, and he said, Sister, you really are a great hairstylist. And I explained to brother what I did to help to teach people how to cut hair was exactly the same way I teach people how to design a speech. Because in hair cutting, you cut a central guide, you work the framework, then you do the lining and the edging, and then you run your fingers through the hair, and it's as if it talks to you and you know how to freeform. Yeah. You can't teach people to freeform. You have to learn how to do it. And I just explained exactly the same with a speech. You have to start with a central premise and then build the structure, add the open, the close, and then you add the refinement. And what I was doing at that particular time was freeforming. There's no guide. Your hands and your shears work together. And I said, was saying how, diff how difficult it is, was to teach that. And all hairstylists or all speakers, you have to prove to me that you can create that foundation, that, that certainly the, the outline, the structure of the haircut, the structure of the speech. Right. Of, and before you can freeform, before you can start anywhere you like. And my brother said, of course, sister, you have to master technique in order to abandon it. So, for example, once you prove to me I understand speech structure, you can do what the heck you like. Because it's inside. And we often hear, Brian, people say, oh, Tom Peters breaks all the rules. But this is the point. You have to understand the rule and know why you strategically choose to break it for what effect. Yep. And another principle from brother, so not only do you master technique in order to abandon it, brother also says, and this is why during my personal development, I've worked with acting coaches, comedy coaches, screenwriting classes, a I mean, lot of different genres. Every entertainment, every rock show or theater, I ask myself, what are these individuals, these professionals doing that I can learn from and adapt to my format and teach my clients? Because Robert says, the principles in any one discipline are exactly the same as the principles in any other discipline. Yep. One other lesson, and this is part of time management. This is one of his major themes, and this is absolutely my focus at this point in my career. You have to slow down to speed up. When you are as energetic and have plenty of energy, plenty of interests, plenty of opportunities, more clients than you can possibly handle, you have to slow down, make good choices, Great sometimes advice. do less to speed up. 
Yep. All right. So that that was jam packed with some amazing things, uh, Patricia. Um, and I know you've got your frippisms, right? My frippisms. Frippisms. <laughs> Could you give us a couple of frippisms? How about this? Rehearsal is the work. Performance is the relaxation. Mm. Life is a series of sales situations. The answer is no if you don't ask. Then there might be leadership is the ability to decide what has to be done and then get people who want to do it. Yeah. Uh, if you look at sales, it might be nobody cares about you. They only care about themselves. Focus your sales presentations to the interests of your prospect. And then let's not forget Fritz. And we certainly hope your listeners won't forget Fripp. And please go to my website, Fripp.com, for <laughs> lots of free information. But much more important than remembering me, remember what Fripp stands for. Frequently reinforce ideas that are productive and profitable. Mm. And how about this one? Opportunity does not knock once. It knocks all the time. We don't always recognize the sound. <laughs> this is so good. Hi, Patricia, I have to ask you, have you, is this just kind of culminated out of all the years of experience that you've had? Or do you sit down and craft these, these uh, little nuggets? No, they, they evolve. They, they come out of your mouth. Now, this is something else that I learned from my brother. Now, we do it naturally. However, brother has such a u unique way of talking about it. Brother is very disciplined. And here's a Robert Fripp Frippicism, which I absolutely agree. Have it on sweatshirts when I'm working on new projects. Mm -hmm. The name of his company is Discipline. Hmm. Discipline, not an end in itself, but a means to an end. None of your listeners, or you, or me, or I should say you or I, will always have to catch yourself if you make a mistake and self-edit. Yep. If you or I are not disciplined, we will not accomplish our goals. Mm -hmm. And it could be as disciplined as enough as slowing down to speed up. However... Now, where was I going with this? Discipline, not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Now, what did you ask me before that? <laughs> I was just asking about how these, these frippicisms have yeah, kind of come, come together. Yeah, exactly. No, thank you. You were paying attention. Congratulations. <laughs> what Robert says is he has the ability to listen to himself speak and sit on his shoulder and listen. And... What I challenge my listeners to do is do the same thing, whether we're speaking, whether we're giving advice to, uh, to our staff, to mentors, or once you're in the creative flow, especially if you are talking to interesting people. And if you ask me what is your favorite pastime, I could tell you reading high action movies. Uh, yeah. However, having interesting conversations with fascinating people. And because when you talk to fascinating people, which is probably why you, you do this, you interview fascinating mm -hmm. people, you will find out of your mouth comes something brilliant that you've never said before. Now, what we have to do is develop the ability to sit on our shoulders and listen to it. However, what happens, and this is what I've become very disciplined to do, if I'm in the middle of a speech when it comes up, I'll say, this is really good. Will you write this down? Because I've never said it before and I'll want to again. Yeah. In conversations, I'll say, this is good. Hold on, let me write it down. And I was being interviewed for somebody like you. And at the end of the inter interview about presentation skills, he said, Patricia, what is the number one secret of a good presentation? And just as I was saying, 
there is no one secret. I said, hold on, Todd. What I'm about to say, I want to say again, let me write it down because I've never said it before. And this is what it was. And now it's part of my repertoire. Mm -hmm. I said, there is no one secret in giving a great speech or presentation. However, if there were one, it would be that the subject is of interest to your listeners. Because if your subject is as in, if, of interest to your listeners, they will forgive you not being perfect or polished yep. while you are developing the platform skills. So, for example, anyone who tunes into your show is interested in presentation skills. And if they are receiving more impact and information and advice from the time invested in listening to this, they will forgive me for getting where I was because I went off. <laughs> Absolutely. And especially since you delivered such a brilliant secret, and if there was a secret, you've got the special ingredient right there. It is all about the subject and whether or not your audience is interested in that. Yes. Well, Patricia, let's transition to the, the portion of our discussion where we talk about um, really kind of some rapid fire Q&A type questions. Okay. So I'm going to give you maybe a half dozen questions. The first thing that comes to your mind, and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. So when you're giving a presentation, do you prefer slides or no slides? It depends on the purpose. Oh. Often keynotes without, often with, for training, definitely with. Perfect. All right. Who is one speaker that inspires you the most and why? And I know you know a lot of speakers, but is there one person that you look to that you admire and, uh, and why is that? If I really had to pick one, it would be Jeannie Robertson, mm. who was the president of NSA the year after I was, and she is the consummate humorist. And it's not only for her talent and her presentation, it's her discipline to constantly create new material. Excellent. You love discipline, don't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. As one of my friends said, I was the only woman in this group of speakers. And Don Thorne used to say, we used to call you our token broad. Now we realize you're our token dominatrix. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Um, and I know more about my personality than you really wanted to. Exactly. She, as my brother said, I'm not surprised my sister get paid to tell people what to do. <laughs> she was a very bossy little girl. I can relate to that. I know some, some, some ladies in my life that are very similar to that. <laughs> yeah. And you're better for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We could all use a little bossiness and discipline in our lives. So, Patricia, what's, what's the craziest, funniest, silliest, most bizarre thing that's ever happened to you while on stage or before an audience? Well, I once delivered a speech in a customized Wonder Woman costume. <laughs> and before I walked out on stage, I had to descend in a spaceship in a nightclub called Pulsations, and it descended from the ceiling uh, f four or five stories, and to get into the spaceship without people actually seeing me in my costume, which was important to the meeting planner, okay. I had to, part of it, climb hand over hand up a ladder on the outside of the building now, can you imagine the guy behind me? Because this was a very brief little costume. Mm. I was a lot younger then with a cape, but he had to hold my cape as he was walking behind me so I wouldn't trip on it. The, what, How about that? Where was the, like, what, what and when was this? This is hilarious. This was 
in Philadelphia for the Hamilton ba Hamilton Bank. And the gentleman who booked me is, is the gentleman who, who discovered me at the National Speakers Association, Mike Frank. And when I had my hairstyling salon, we used to have a lot of Halloween costume parties yeah. to promote business. And I had a custom made Wonder Woman outfit with a cape, which I still wear now. I don't have such a brief little costume. I wear more gold leggings. <laughs> However, the cape, the, everything else, and I still deliver speeches in it now, even as a mature woman. <laughs> However, I had sent out a photograph of me in the costume as, as my Christmas card. And Mike got a call, and they said, we need to book a speaker. However, it has to be very special speaker. One, they need to talk on customer service, which I did at the time. Two, they have to be in good shape. Three, they can't be too heavy. Four, it would be very nice if they owned their own costume that would be appropriate to step out of a spaceship. Now, you understand they can't be too heavy because of the mechanism that brought you down. Yep. You had to be in good shape because you had to climb on the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. So Mike Frank said, there is only one speaker you can hire. One, she's spoken at one of your other branches and was successful. I know I booked her. Mm -hmm. Two, her subject is getting, keeping, and deserving customers. Three... She works out all the time. Four, I know her. She isn't much more than 105 pounds. And five, I know she owns her own customized woman, Wonder Woman costume. So that's how I got the book. Great. I love it. I think that's probably the best story that I've heard. And I've heard some good ones on the oh, show. Good. Good, 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 good. good. <laughs> So Patricia, it's pretty clear and apparent um, what the answer is to this next question, but I, I want to ask your opinion on what you think. What type of impact, or maybe can you describe the impact that being able to speak and communicate has had on your career and your business? If I had not developed my presentation skills, the chances are I would not have traveled the world on somebody else's dime. I would not be in a position to interact, learn from, and to make a contribution to some of the highest level executives in Fortune 500 companies. I would not have had the privilege of sharing ideas with thousands of audiences and meeting even more thousands of wonderful people. It has been an incredible education of which I will never take for granted and constantly surround myself with those I can learn from and keep as fresh as I possibly can so I continue to earn the right of being able to stand on stage or in a boardroom and teach them how to be frequentized. <laughs> Well, I can still be cutting hair, and I have the varicose veins to prove I had 24 years behind the chair. I'm glad we don't add another 30 years to that. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's, that's quite an inspirational statement for, for those of us that are just getting started with, with pursuing this path of becoming better communicators. So thanks for sharing that. One last question for you, Patricia, before we call it quits today. I would love to hear from you, especially as somebody who regularly works with all kinds of professionals on improving their communication and persuasion skills. What's one bit of advice that you would give someone who's just getting started? All right. Think big, start small. Do not be impatient. Enjoy the process. And build rehearsal and improvement into your everyday life. So if you want to improve your storytelling, do it at the water fountain. Do it over lunch. Do it at the dinner table. 
And how you get to be a better speaker leaves a lot of answers to one short question. But this is how everybody becomes a better speaker at any level, beginner, intermediate, advanced. One, you have to understand what you're doing superbly well. I don't care if you have no platform skills, don't know what to do with your hands. Perhaps it's as simple as your great grasp of your content. Two, you need to learn what it is that distracts from you being as impactful as you can be. Yep. Because every, everything we do on stage or the front of a boardroom adds to or distracts from our message and impact. And three, you need to learn more about presentation skills from somebody who knows more about it than you do. They don't have to be the best speech coach in the world or the most experienced speaker or the most articulate or best on stage or the funniest. They just need to know more than you do at your point of your development. Hmm. And if your goal is to be a good communicator, you might find you need somebody else to tell you your strengths and where you're distracting. Could be a mastermind group, could be a Toastmaster club. However, anytime you receive feedback from anybody, you need to ask, are they qualified to give me feedback? And do they have my best interests at heart, interests at heart? Because very often, unsolicited feedback really has more to do with the person giving it yep. than the person receiving it. That's why. Do they have your best intentions and are they qualified? Love it. All right. Well, I have to go back and, and take notes uh, and watch the recording of this because you did just share so many great things, Patricia. Um, it was a blast having you here. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. And we're going to have all of uh, the links to your website, the different resources and training materials that you've got, um, as well as anything else like your social media profiles over at whatthespeak.com in the show notes for this episode. And I want to truly, truly thank you for your time, for sharing you know, your personal story, the insights that you've been able to, to glean over uh, such a long and fantastic career. And you are someone that kicks ass when they speak, present, or pitch. Thank you. My pleasure. And let's hope 2014 is the year everybody who listens improves their presentation skills. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you liked what today's guest had to share in our discussion, you may want to grab an audio copy of their latest book for free by going to wtsaudiobook.com. That's wtsaudiobook.com. All right. Here we go with the outro. Thanks so much for joining us today on What the Speak. Be sure to visit whatthespeak.com for show notes on every episode and to sign up for our email list to stay updated on resources that'll help you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. 